We've all been discriminated against at some point in our lives, whether it be because of our background, media stereotypes, our skin color. It's everywhere, spanning across countries, state lines, neighborhoods, and even our own backyards. That's right. Hidden under, hidden under all that grass was a world kind of like our own, a world filled with bustling communities, agriculture, hunting, monarchies, and even great world wars. <laughs> it lies just under our feet, obscured by our everyday activities. This world is filled with little critters that, while reflective of us, are still a nuisance when they enter our homes and wreak havoc. You know them, you love them, hate them, and <laughs> Surprisingly, these little guys are incre incredibly discriminatory. While not in the same sense as our human version, ants practice discrimination and other social aspects we conduct conducted throughout history. They established queens for their socialist lifestyles, used aphids as, used aphids as cows, cultivated fungus to eat, and even built incredible feats of architecture for their colonies. But on the extreme level of this, they've been shown to practice slavery. <laughs> First being witnessed in 1810 by Geneva naturalist Pierre Huber with the species Polyergus, or Amazon ants. These animals have managed to evolve into following a social behavior that humans have been conducting years prior to this discovery. Uh, and currently, there are over 50 ant species that practice slavery. But how do they do this? Why do they practice slavery? And, what, and most importantly, <laughs> and most importantly, how does this relate to our human society? our nature, and our behaviors. To start off, let's actually understand how ancestral slavery happens <laughs> using Oliver de Latre from the University of Paris' article, Do Host Species Evolve a Specific Response to Slave-Picking Ants? We'll use the Amazon ants as examples for this. And to help visualize, I'll use a wonderful simulation to demonstrate. <laughs> First, a scout from the Amazon ants will search for a host colony. After doing so, they will return to their nest and release pheromones, which are basically smells that ants use to communicate, telling the rest of the colony, Ayo, I found a community to read. Let's go. <laughs> After that, the Amazon ants essentially pillage the host colony, killing the fenders, and taking the larva with them back to their home. You can see that with this slide with the red dots purposely targeting the, the nest while leaving the queen alone. It's important to note that slave-making ants want to continue to have a supply of slaves, making them keep the host colony alive. They will do two things with these larvae. <laughs> Either eating the babies and then the story right there and there, or letting them grow into adults indoctrinating them into their colony by overloading them with their pheromones to fulfill their work as new slaves of the colony. This includes, taking, this includes taking care of the enslavers' larva, feeding the enslavers, and even tending to the amount, cleaning, making new spaces for storage, anything for the Amazon ants. Now why the hell would an ant species practice this social behavior? What drove them to do such an act on another species? The main reason why these Amazon ants and other species conduct slavery is because they lack most pheromone compounds. As I said earlier, these pheromones are essential for ants to communicate with each other. So in other words, imagine Amazon ants as partners who are really bad at communicating. And if you've ever been in that situation, you know several issues will arise. And man, do these issues show up for these ants? 
they cannot take care of their larva, clean their nests, defend themselves, or even eat without the need of assistance. That's why they evolved such an extreme method to survive. However, no one likes to be oppressed or restricted of their natural freedom. Where am I going with this? Well, the ants take it from their homes, forced to conduct hard labor for the enslavers, and manipulated to have seed, and manipulated to attack their own species when needed, having seen to sometimes rebel. Tobias Hamager from the University of Mons in Germany notes this interesting behavior in their article, Slave Rebellion is widespread than ants. Remember those pheromones ants used to communicate? Well, the ants that were kidnapped from their colonies actually maintained a unique sense. Even after being bombarded with enslavers' own pheromones, these ants still retained their own original identity. And because of that, they're able to identify their real enemies, actively killing the enslavers' larvae and adults, and taking charge against such oppressive rule. This, in turn, severely decreases the population of the slaver ants, allowing for other host colonies the ability to better defend themselves, to better prepare for future raids, to have a more secure environment away from this ant. But how does this relate to us? How does this even relate to discrimination in our social behaviors? Hell, why ants? We'll use Lisa O'Brien and her colleagues from Rice University's perspective on this. Firstly, the pheromones ants use aren't just for communicating. As I said earlier with the ant, with the ant rebellion, they are also what identifies them as ants of different species. They've evolved the behavior to discriminate others, pushing their ant agendas on their other species like, like we saw with the ants on ants. And as I said previously, ants are similar to us. They work together as a collective to solve complex issues in their environment, are naturally social creatures, and have built a society that reflects ours. Their societies are a simplification of our own. To further show this, O'Brien and her colleagues would use ants in their study to see how their teamwork is reflected on humans. With ants, we see, human, we see something called swarm intelligence. That is, ants use individual cognitive responses to work together to solve complex problems. We see group think but with humans, we see cognitive intelligence. We see group thinking responses rather than solo thinking amongst ourselves to solve our issues. To put it simply, ants act individually, act individually when working together, while we humans literally put our minds together to solve our problems. Even with these slight differences in teamwork, we still see ourselves heavily reflected in that society in terms of how we come up with a solution. Lastly, they developed a social behavior that we humans have gone through, that of slavery and the eventual war against it. The inherent nature of being free to be an individual, more or less friends, and to promote a better environment while still struggling with this form of discrimination is so closely tied to our natural behavior. But how do I use, but now I know I use ants to analyze our behavior, but let me be clear. This is not an analogy where I found two similar things and drew a conclusion. This is a, merely a reflection of our social behaviors. We are far more evolved than ants, yet we are still bound by nature and thus should reflect our social behaviors to nature. However, because we are far more complex than ants, we, as humans, have evolved a spectacular ability to choose to go against this nature. Unlike ants, who share our similar social woes, but can't break away from it because of their instinct, we consciously choose to fight against that issues that plague our world. The ants may rebel against their enslavers, but they do it out of the instinct to survive. We chose to do it. Because we chose to do it, not because of an instinct. And that is an amazing ability that is often overlooked. Today, tomorrow, and in the future, we are making decisions to combat discrimination and metamorphosizing away from the past. 
Ants may have been far, here far longer than we have, but we have the capability to decide what we want for our, for our world. And even right now, outside our social conflicts, you are making decisions right now. Unlike breathing automatically, you actively made a decision that might affect you in the future. You, as the audience, chose to come to this event. We, as talkers, chose to give our topics. I, as a speaker right now, vehemently chose not to give you an analysis on the B-movie or a bug's life, <laughs> and instead this to show how far we've come from the behaviors of an ant to the capabilities of a human. And with conscious thought, I choose to say thank you for coming to my talk.